from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in the commentary box at the Oval in South London for the final chapter of this enthralling Men's Ashes series. Can the Aussies make it 3-1? Can Ben Stokes and his team put a little pinprick in the balloon of optimism uh, that is the Aussies trying to win the Ashes on English soil for the first time since 2001. My co-host alongside me is certainly hoping that the Aussies can make some history. Ali, thank you. Jim Maxwell, yes, it's lovely to be the place where the Ashes started all those years ago, about 140 years ago, when a bloke called Spofforth uh, went through the England side and some other chap over there watching it got so nervous about it he chewed the uh, top end of his umbrella stick off and um, that was the tension and excitement and the rest of it uh, all those years ago and still the same I think uh, we'll probably have a good following big house here watching it all a lot of Aussies still in town and they want to see Australia do the business 3-1 <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Charu Sharma. I'm back in Chandigarh because we're right in the middle, well, towards the end stages of the Punjab Premier League called the Sheri Punjab T20, which is a very northern phrase. In the middle, of course, I run off to do the auction for our very own Karnataka League, which is now called the Maharaja's Trophy. Then, of course, I came to Delhi to finish some other event off. And uh, as soon as the uh, Punjab League ends uh, this weekend, I run off to Andhra Pradesh, Vizak, to do their player auction because they too are doing this league. And why are they all sandwiched together? Because there's no other window. And we're right in the middle of the monsoon here in India. So go figure. <laughs> go figure indeed. Um, there is a plaque actually on the Hobbs Gate behind the pavilion here at the Oval Gym, which mm -hmm. now declares the Oval as the birthplace of the Ashes. There's a huge mural, uh, in fact, uh, on the outside uh, wall as you come down the Harleyford Road uh, that has that uh, mock obituary painted on the wall, mm -hmm. which appeared in the Sporting Times. But I have to say that perhaps Sunbury uh, in Victoria might have something to say about that, because as you drive out uh, of Melbourne towards the airport, of course, that is decreed as the birthplace of the Ashes, because that is where the actual urn uh, was first filled with the ashes of a burnt bale, as we think it was, and presented mm. to the England captain. So the Oval and Sunbury, both birthplaces of the ashes, but this is where the ashes will be decided one way or another, whether it's the Aussies that win it outright. And that's what we're going to start talking about today because uh, they were 2-1 up going into the fourth test. 2-1, uh, two, two, uh, that is four out of five. So this is the final one. After three days of that match at Old Trafford, well, England did have every chance of making it to all uh, coming into the Oval. Uh, but if you've ever been to Manchester, well, you will know that there is always a possibility of rain, even in the middle of summer. And well, it did rain. It came tipping down and just 30 overs were bowled on day four. And day five was a total washout. And so the game was drawn, which means that the tourists will be taking the urn back to Australia. They can't now be beaten. Uh, Jim, I mean, you've called some Ashes moments over the years. And we kept Test Match Special and ABC Radio going for some seven hours on that final day when it mm. did not stop raining. Until, of course, the point came when you could deliver the news that the game had been cooled off and the Ashes were secured. A dramatic moment of broadcasting for you. <laughs> or was it? <laughs> uh, it was slightly anticlimactic, I have to say. I, I think we'd all got tired of waiting around for the decision to be made by the umpires be 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 because, you know, the pigs would have drowned in the outfield. Uh, it was so much water around the place. Why did they take so long? Um, I know they were playing by the rules and this, that and the other regarding when they could call it off, I guess. But, uh, yes... It was late in the day, and it was a real anti-climax, given that Australia had struggled to be competitive in that game uh, from the word go, really, when they floundered a bit on the opening day and couldn't get big partnerships and, and then got um, shellacked all over the ground by that magnificent innings from uh, Zach Crawley. So they were playing from behind a, a little bit, I suppose, at the time. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, it was very disappointing, not just because which way the game may have gone in the end, but because we've had one of the greatest Ashes series of all time and uh, have a damp squib like that hit us. Uh, at the moment when everything was on the edge and so full of expectation was very annoying. And, um, yeah, well done, Australia. But um, I, I think they'll, they'll realise that they may have got away with one there. And because they had um, some money in the bank, they won the series. Well, 
Retain the ashes. <laughs> Retain the ashes. Yes. As so I said far. to Z- Pat Cummins yesterday doing an interview, um, because you know you always want to get on the right side of the person you're talking to. So it started like, congratulations, Pat. You are the first Australian captain to lead a team that has won the World Championship of Test Cricket and retained the ashes. That's true. Yep. No one else has done that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Charu, I mean, it was the weather at Old Trafford that really proved the damp squib, and I'm sure the Aussies didn't mind it at all. They didn't mind it, but it has lends itself to a lot of conversation about just what cricket could do to you know, prevent time being lost out of the game, either due to rain or bad light. Um, you can have multitude conversations about whether you can build roofs over stadiums. And there are lots in the uh, Major League Baseball in the States at an enormous cost as well. Uh, but what about, you know, if teams don't get the overs in, should play start half an hour earlier, say, to add some time on early in England? I mean, it's always an 11 a.m. start. And I have to say 10.30 a.m. worked perfectly well during the World Test Championship final here in June Um, and what about if the light gets too low for you know a captain to bowl his quicks as we saw happened at Old Trafford as well when it was dry why not introduce a pink ball of a similar age to the red ball and carry on I feel we've we've touched on this subject before on Stumped but you know what 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 do you reckon Well, are all these discussions and options now because a certain home team lost or what? But more on that later. Because this, <laughs> I this think is if it's the other way around, problem. it'd be the Aussies leading the conversation <laughs> on this point as well. Yeah, but, you know, cricket, sadly, was invented in, if I may use the term, a wet country. So you guys should have known better 150 <laughs> years ago or 500 years ago that, that it is going to be disrupted if it does rain. But there are some minor easy fixes. You mentioned maybe advancing it by half an hour and a couple of other things. There's, there's day-night tests now, which, of course, don't really help if the weather is bad. If it rains, it doesn't matter day or night. Uh, the match is going to be called off or, or delayed. In white ball cricket, they've been able to fix that a bit because of the, you know, Duckworth Lewis and other variations where you are given some sort of a target. And it is possible on occasion, controversially sometimes, to finish the game. But test matches, you know, what can I say? It, it, this is one of the big problems because who wants to be watching, say, four and a half days or or three and a half days and have a test match watched out, washed out because. Uh, it doesn't encourage spectatorship. It reduces viewership as well because you never know it's going to be on or not. And that's why test matches are, once again, I say very humbly, in danger because they don't fit the modern concept of, of sport where it needs to finish. It needs to have a, a quick finish as well. Um, and I, 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 there's no easy fix at all. Uh, and, and the more crowded the uh, international cricket calendar gets, you can't even seek a potentially drier um, time zones in, in various countries to be able to hold test matches because they'll only be held when they're, they'll be held. And in, in, in most countries, uh, I mean, Guyana, for instance, has a horrendous record and still keep playing test matches there. It's probably got the most number of rained off matches. Um, so where do we play in the Sahara? Maybe not. I, I, I don't know. I, there's no easy fix at all except a little tweak in terms of time here and, and maybe a few extra overs there. Uh, and, of course, uh, artificial lighting when possible. But, of course, there's a little bit of dew on the ground. So uh, there's just absolutely no easy fix. You've got to take your medicine and learn how to give it and take it when, it, when, it, when there's bad weather. <laughs> You're in approval of that, Jim? Yes, absolutely. The only way to fix Manchester is not to play there, which they won't be until 2031 at not the an, earliest. Not in ashes. It's the wettest <laughs> cricket venue in the world. Wetter than Sydney. Remember that. OK, so it's going to happen. I don't know, do you move Manchester to Portugal or Spain? Oh, well, you know the weather's going to be half decent. Um, there was no belly aching 10 years ago when Alistair Cook and his mob um, retained the ashes. There's been a lot of belly aching in England about all sorts of things related to the outcome of this game. I just say, suck it up and get on with it. I'm pretty sure there was some belly aching probably from the Australians that watched the not rainfall. From, not from the home <laughs> team, though. Going on about extra days and all sorts of stuff. They were very happy with the retention of the ashes. Yeah, there's definitely then. been other series in England, whether England are on top or not, when play time is lost due to... I mean, it's Easy, not that the rain too. is one thing, but I tell you what, it's, it's the bad light which gets everyone so irked because you've got, you know, it's when spectators are seeing floodlights are on. Mm. They go, what's the point of having True. floodlights if players still have to come off at 4pm because it's a gloomy day in August or wherever venue you are. A draw is still a result. Just remember that. Result, and we don't yeah. get many draws. <laughs> if we get five clear days, normally we'll always get 
a result other than a draw. Mm. I have to say, Joe Root's comment to me at Manchester, which made a little bit of a waves uh, in the BBC, was and then you know got picked up by the ICC. I think even Ricky Ponting was asked to comment on it. Mm. Was um, Joe's suggestion that perhaps when it is light and it is good weather, just play until 10:30. It doesn't get light, doesn't get dark until 10 p.m. in England. Just keep playing until we get all the overs in. That, that really is typical. That <laughs> but that is typical lip service from both England, and they're the worst in this series, and Australia on over rates. They don't care. Uh, They'll bowl 12 overs an hour and they get away with it. Well, the players certainly don't want to be fined, that's for sure, and their well, fines have now been reduced. Yeah. So perhaps with some sort of in-game penalty is what's going to be needed to make sure we get well, the overs in. Or points, play... Points. Yeah. yeah, yeah, points deduction. Or make yeah. it like a, a one-day international where you've got to bowl 30 overs, then you'll have lunch, then you've got to get 30 overs in, and then you'll have tea. But then we could be here until 8pm at night, which or, I don't think course. anyone wants, and broadcasters don't want that uncertainty either. Or, Alison, if you can <laughs> want to get really complicated mathematically, perhaps there should be way given for the stage at which a match is rained off and then of course you, you get bragging rights because you get a certain number of points if you're obviously up I, I suppose you can argue there's no obviously up but uh, you know that could somehow mitigate the, the you know the, the sadness of losing or a game when you may actually be on top, as England was certainly uh, in, in that uh, test match. Well, you would, the Aussies would say you never know. They could have batted well, an entire yeah, day yeah. and kept England at bay for those five wickets. But then I quite like your idea that if a weighted draw, a winning draw or a losing draw, no, we'll, leave, no, we'll leave that please. to the mathematicians. We'll leave that to the mathematicians. There's enough mucking around with the game as it is. The point system's fine for the women's ashes, but don't bring something like that into play here. I don't think it's talking about points. It's talking about either saying a, yeah, a winning draw or a losing draw. Maybe, or maybe, maybe you could go two and a half up instead of two one up. Well, <laughs> listen, if Messrs Duckworth and Lewis can come up with that really complicated scenario for rain-washed matches uh, or rain-delayed matches in uh, ODIs or white ball cricket, surely there can be some mathematical formula to try and... Well, presume on, on the result of a test match as well. It's not so difficult. I mean, it might be incomprehensible, but for mathematics, <laughs> mathematicians, it may not be too difficult. Next on Stump, the Indian women's captain, Harmanpreet Kaur, is one of the most high-profile players in the game. Hugely talented batter. It was only a few months ago that she was named as one of Wisdom's five cricketers of the year, becoming the first Indian woman ever to do so. However, she's come under fire for her behaviour during India's third and final ODI against Bangladesh, which ended in a tie. After being given out by umpire Tanvir Ahmed, Harmanpreet smashed the stumps with her bat and later at the post-match presentation called the standard of umpiring pathetic. She carried this on during the trophy photo, telling the Bangladesh captain that she should get the umpires in the photo as well as it was the umpires who tied the game for them. Harmanpreet has since been suspended for the next two international matches following two separate breaches of the ICC Code of Conduct. She's suspended because she's received two lots of two demerit points and once you get four demerit points where you miss two ODIs or two T20s, whichever comes first or indeed one test if that was to be the case. Charu, I was quite appalled by the video footage I, I saw of the incident mm. and the follow-up. Uh, what has the reaction been like in India to this? Because she's not just the player even, she's the captain of the national side. Well, so here's a personal opinion. I lower my head in some level of shame. And then I lift it up again to say that uh, the reaction has been consistently critical uh, from all quarters, from senior cricketers, older cricketers, administrators, just about everybody who follows the game. Um, well, about the incident itself, uh, in fact, Diana Edelji, who's a part of the BCCI, has also come out in, in sharp criticism. Uh, there's a little bit of, you know, in sport in general, we do hear about uh, in the heat of the moment. Now, sometimes you can be a little, well, you don't have to condone it, but you can be a little understanding, sympathetic. If you say, well, in the heat of the moment, just the, the next five seconds following an incident, and it happens in most sports, it is not limited to cricket, certainly not. In fact, it's the least in cricket. There can be some sort of a reaction which you regret later. But I think what happened at the presentation ceremony was very deliberate. And I think that was something that, I don't know how Harman Pre thought she could get away with it because the world's eyes, the cameras are everywhere and microphones are everywhere. And, and that was very disrespectful. I think even more disrespectful than what was obviously done uh, by throwing this, uh, by, by hitting the stumps down. So that was deliberate. And uh, if, if there were legal people involved here, they'd probably say that that, that was, uh, that can't be condoned because that was, uh, I mean, she knew what she was doing then. There was no heat at the moment at that point in time. And perhaps at that point in time, she should certainly have not 
exacerbated the situation by 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 making an obvious comment which referred to the fact that the empires also belong to the Bangladesh team. So uh, I'll I'll repeat that the uh, criticism in India has been sound and uh, consistent. What about? the BCCI. Are they going to bring any penalty down on her for bringing the game into disrepute? She should get 12 months and lose the captaincy, in my opinion. Well, she's not exactly sandpapering the ball, but... Um, sorry. No, but, but, but she's bringing the game into disrepute. Yes. And that, that yes. wasn't... And Just to remember, those guys, Warner and Bancroft and uh, Smith, yeah. got done not for ball tampering, but for bringing the game into disrepute at the press conference when they told lies. That's why they got the penalty, not for ball tampering. So that's why I'm saying in this case, this is one of the most outrageous things I've ever seen. If it was happening in the men's game, they'd be going berserk and she'd be out for a couple of years for sure. So I just hope that the BCCI uh, look at it uh, a bit more sternly than the ICC have. Well, I also think, you know, I wonder, and this is only conjecture on my behalf, quite obviously, that the women's game is now rising internationally. I mean, it's already very big in Australia and England. And I wonder if the reactions are a touch muted, uh, particularly from the Indian board, because they don't want to now uh, cause a setback with, with harsh punishments and, in a way, you, you know, warn people off uh, women's cricket. Of course, it might wor- work the reverse, where... If you do it now, and if the strictures are strong now, you might encourage the women to take up the game in, in, in a better spirit or the original spirit of the game. So, yeah, you can argue about the fact that she should really be by the Indian officials. Um, uh, there should be a, a harsher acknowledgement and, and perhaps even if you want to use the term punishment for Harman Preet because she's, as captain particularly, certainly not setting uh, uh, the right standards that youngsters are to follow. Who alone knows? Some guys might start doing it in lower league matches or even higher matches thinking, well, if the captain can get away at the very highest level, maybe I can do it too and show my ire. But like I said, there's a big difference between, to me, between heat of the moment, where a lot of sports persons tend to get away with it, you know, with a lighter wrap on the knuckles, and then a deliberate comment later on. I, I, I certainly agree with that. I think th- things do happen in the heat of the moment on the field. But what Harman Preet did to carry it on was was more shocking for me. And I don't believe as yet, certainly as we're recording this, there hasn't been any further comment from Harman Preet. We haven't heard any contrition or mm-hmm. acknowledgement even that what she did was inappropriate, unacceptable. That needs to come. I think there should be an apology. There should be an apology to the Bangladesh captain as well for making the team and the captain of Bangladesh uncomfortable at that trophy presentation as well. I wonder what her WPL franchise thinks of it as well is there a degree of of protection coming from there but i certainly think punishments and the way in which incidents like this are viewed needs to be consistent and harman preet is not a young player she's not a non-professional she's been in the game for a long time now she absolutely knows as as do all women cricketers who are playing the game at an international level and as professionals that that sort of behavior is not acceptable and what is in the laws is the spirits of cricket which we've talked about as being a nebulous concept but one thing which is certainly written down is to respect the decision of the umpire and in actual fact she had no reason to gripe the decision because she thought she was given out lbw incorrectly in actual fact it came off the bat she was caught at slip so you know in, in that sense, she, she absolutely had no gripe with the umpire at all. And the umpire didn't make, didn't make an error in, in that regard. So I would like to see an apology from Harman Preet and some acknowledgement that her behaviour was, as I think universally amongst cricket, has been seen as unacceptable. You know, I must also, I listen quickly add that there's been some level of not condoning, but, you know, simple, well, understanding that she is from the north of India, where people tend to be a little more hot-headed. No, I think that's no excuse at all. In fact, it's uh, clubbing all of North India into such behavior, which is untrue. I'm sitting right in the middle of North India right now. And uh, uh, yes, I mean, people are a little more aggressive in this part compared to the South, where I love living. But uh, that's also just sort of typecasting people, and stere- stereotyping people, which is, is uh, probably either, is worsening it? the situation. Yes. Well, that's what we've got time for on this week's Stump. So I'll say thanks to Jim Maxwell and Charis Sharma and to all of you for listening. See you again next week. Bye bye.